Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's session, um, which is called Above the Law. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered this evening, the Wurundjeri people, and to pay my respects to elders past and present. One of the reasons we pay our respects to Aboriginal elders is that they are traditionally the custodians of the law and history. So I think it's particularly apt that um, in Law and Order Week at the Wheeler Centre we acknowledge the traditional owners. Um, it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce you to two um, very entertaining and exciting speakers, I'm sure you will agree. <laughs> Stuart Littlemore, face familiar to many of you, is a barrister and media watchdog turned crime fiction author. PM Newton, or Pamela Mary to her friends, <laughs> is a, an ex-cop, uh, a West African music aficionado turned crime fiction author. And my name is Angela Savage. I'm a convicted criminal turned crime <laughs> fiction author. Although I don't think the Wheeler Centre knew that when they asked me onto this panel. And I'm sure if I'd had Stuart defending me, I probably wouldn't have gone down because technically I was in the driveway and not on the uranium mine site when I was arrested. They all say that. <laughs> in my case, it's true. Um, both uh, Pam and Stuart have... Well, it's interesting that tonight's session is called Above the Law because I'm not quite sure that that's really an accurate way to describe either of our panellists. I think Stuart's very much in the law and Pam's probably over, over the law, <laughs> as in the O-V-A-H, Kath and Kim sense of the word. But I thought we might begin by talking a little bit or, uh, about your, law, your careers in the law and, um, if you like, the point up to which you then um, turn to crime fiction. <laughs> Anne, would you like to begin? Uh, okay. I, um, I stumbled into the police force, I guess, uh, in 1982. And uh, I'd been at university. I was studying to become a teacher and uh, was doing a BA. And I completed the BA, like a lot of people, uh, you know, a Bachelor of Arts is an entertaining way to spend some time and read some good books uh, and study history and politics and uh, it was, it was all very enjoyable. But I really couldn't see myself uh, teaching and uh, as a early 20s horse mad young woman I thought to myself, this is a job where I could get paid to ride a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Mightn't be a bad idea. Um, so that, that was kind of as uh, detailed as I got. I, I did, I was attracted to the idea of public service, um, something that I didn't really uh, feel a great attraction for and to this day don't is working in private enterprise. I, I, I find it hard to get excited and more and more so I guess as um, management speak has taken over. So it, it, it appealed. It was outdoors. It was a job that promised that it was not going to be the same thing every day. And that's what I did. I joined the uh, New South Wales Police Force. In those days, you trained at the Redfern Academy, which is also where the horses were stabled. So mm -hmm. as I would do my jogging and my running, I would see the horses and think that was where I was going to go. But uh, I did quite well at my exams and was tapped on the shoulder and told that, uh, you know, looking at shoveling horse manure around for the rest of my career was perhaps not the best use of my talents and that I ought to consider plain clothes. So in those days you did a year, uh, you did initial training, then you went to a police station, which in my case was Redfern, uh, did a year in uniform there, and then back you did your secondary training, and very shortly after that I went into plain clothes, and I remained a detective. Uh, worked at suburban stations, um, rural stations, mid-north coast, <laughs> which was quite nice, and um, specialist squads. But eventually, and I, I've put the line in my book that I, I got sick of meeting people for the first time on the worst day of their life. And a lot of the time people blame you for that day. Mm -hmm. um, I just became less and less enamoured of the job. And when I did eventually leave, it was not with any great plan. I, I probably had as much plan leaving the job as I'd had going into the job. Um, and the plan certainly didn't include being a writer of any way, shape or form. Mm. We'll get on to that, how that <laughs> how, where that writerly urge came from. How about you, Stuart? Well, hmm. I always wanted to be a barrister, and I think that began because, as a boy... The, I watched television and the ABC had 
as they still have, series about lawyers. And there was one, I can't remember the name of it, it was Somebody QC. And Michael Dennison played the part, and it was about a London barrister defending people in difficult cases. And I, I thought, yeah, that's what I'd like to do. But I didn't work very hard at school. <laughs> and so when it came to my matriculation, it wasn't all that impressive. And by then I'd formed the view that I was sick of school anyway and learning, and I wanted to be a writer. And, the only, and I was writing plays at the time, and I naively asked the ABC to put me on as an apprentice playwright. And they said, we've never had one of those. <laughs> but, but why don't you take a cadetship or apply for a cadetship in journalism? And they gave me one. And I worked there until I completed my cadetship. And the minute it was over, I got on the plane and went to London and talked, lied my way into a job at the BBC. You couldn't be a journalist in England until you were 24. And I think I was 21 when I arrived. So every job I had done, every ABC regional newsroom I'd worked in for three months or a month became a year and, <laughs> and, and so on. I was shamelessly lied my way into it and spent a few years in London working for BBC television, which was absolutely wonderful. And you often wonder, I often wonder, what if I'd stayed writing for mm. television in England? But I married in England and my wife and I came to Australia to live, back to Australia to live. And I worked for the ABC. Uh, I got sacked. I worked <laughs> for Channel 9, I got sacked. I worked for Channel 10, I got sacked. I worked for Channel 7 for one day and I sacked myself. <laughs> and at the age of, it took some years for all those processes. I worked on This Day Tonight and programs like that. And I thought, what job can't you be sacked from? The bar. Because <laughs> nobody will employ you. So I went at the age of 30 to law school and, and uh, put myself through law school by doing a, a television program called The Flicks. I did it before David and Margaret. <laughs> Uh, and made documentaries and that sort of thing. And when I finished, I went straight to the bar, which almost nobody does anymore. It's a very English thing to do, and I had that in mind. And I wasn't making much money for the first few years, so I kept doing television, writing for television, documentaries, until I had enough of a footing. And ten years later, the ABC approached me and asked me if I'd do Media Watch. So I did that for 10 years, and I started to repeat myself, so I stopped. And then I thought, all right, what am I doing by way of anything creative now? And having done criminal law, because, and this is something I'm going to write about in one of the succeeding Harry Curry books, in Sydney at least, and I think it's much the same in Melbourne, bright kids do law and they go to the bar, but if they're working class, they have no contacts. Their fathers don't have a direct line into Minters or Allens. Mm -hmm. So the working class clever boys at, and girls at the bar do criminal law on legal aid. Mm -hmm. And the ones with contacts, oh, this is not absolutely rigid, but it would apply to about 75 or 80 percent of the bar. Uh, the ones with the good contacts do commercial work, look down on criminal law. So the public thinks criminal law is really the pinnacle of <laughs> advocacy. But the legal profession regards it as the gutter. Yeah. <laughs> but, and that's why Harry Curry, who comes, this character of mine, comes from an establishment family. His father was an eminent QC. They always say eminent before they say QC. <laughs> um, what was that one they had on the chaser, on the hamster last night? Notorious Karabakan <laughs> prison. Notorious. So eminent QC, they're all eminent. Um, and his father used to specialise in the legal problems of the rich. And Harry, as all barristers do, had to read with a public defender or a crown prosecutor. And he thought, this, this is just like rugby. <laughs> a very competitive nature, so that's what he wanted to do. And he's never got out of it, even though Harry's not working class, came from a good school and wears Savile Row suits, but he defends the children of the poor. And, and drives a drug dealer's Jaguar. Yes, well, the drug dealer doesn't need it. He's in Long Bay. That's right. It's, uh, a, good, um, it's a good segue into talking about your characters because obviously the, the risk when you're writing from experience like this is, is 
well, why not write memoir, write, why write fiction? So ha- you've both employed different devices to distance yourselves from your main characters. As you mentioned, Stuart, Harry's... Um, he's a bit of a rugger bugger, quite ugly. He's describing it, you know, with... with quite gleefully as very ugly um, with a, an almost Neanderthal brow and I think in cauliflower ears and all kinds of things um, and Pam, of course your central character in the old school is, uh, is Vietnamese Australian tell us, tell us where she, tell us where new, new Ned Kelly came from <laughs> um, well she isn't just sort of a, a reason to be as different from me as I could imagine um, that has just kind of happened. That, that's the way she is. Um, it's it's difficult to say how she arrived because people will... If you're a potential writer, you'll just roll your eyes and gnash your teeth and go, oh, yeah. Because basically she turned up um, when I was writing a story and it was a, a case that I, I hadn't... When I left the police, I did not think of writing really. Um, I'd been travelling in West Africa, I'd got involved uh, in the music there and I was writing liner notes um, for a friend who was publishing um, uh, music with Stern's African uh, label. So I was writing, I was taking photos, I'd done um, a travel piece. I kind of thought, you know, the the fact that I'd been able to sell a travel piece, the fact that my words had been used, uh, I thought, well, okay, maybe I could do this writing thing, but as a photojournalist, certainly not as a fiction writer. But I was living in India um, at the time. I was in Dharamsala uh, because I had been interested when I did finally leave the police force with no plan and faxed them my resignation from London and said I wasn't coming back. Um, I I decided that I wanted to go to um, Dharamsala and study Buddhist philosophy. As you do. As you do. After 13 years in the New South Wales (laughs) Police. 13 years in the New South Wales Police. I felt like I needed to have a bit of a good long think. And um, while I was there, um, I'd been there for about four or five months, and there was a triple murder about 100 yards away from where I was living. And it was uh, three monks were murdered one night in their apartments, and it turned out that the murderers were another five monks, that there was this whole ugly religious war going on below the surface that you know, most of us had not been aware of at that time. This was the late 90s. And uh, you know, I'd been out of the job for probably about two years by then, maybe two and a half years, but it had such an impact on me, um, this event, that uh, I guess, you know, in a way, it was almost probably a bit of delayed stress coming out, and I ended up writing about it and writing about it fictionally. And when you start to write about a murder, um, eventually a cop turns up, and the cop that turned up was this character. And that was, as I said, in the late 90s. The book did not come out until 2010. So I've lived with her for quite a long while through different iterations. When I first met her, she was a hard-bitten detective sergeant on the Homicide Squad. As things turned out, the first book ended up being set in the early 90s, and she's a very early 20s, freshly made detective. So for me, I'm really glad that she did turn up because it did give me a way to be able to write about the police without her being a total vessel for me. Mm. Though, of course, you, you write... You know, she has certain interests. She's got. A, I believe she's she, a bit she of a shares, fan of um, African music. Yes, <laughs> and she shares your um, weak stomach, I believe. Yeah, I gave her. Um, I gave her a, a weak stomach because one of the things that I do dislike about cop shows. Well, and, and a lot of crime fiction is, uh, well, a couple of things. One, I, I never think that they really um, address grief to any great extent, um, which is why there's a, pal- a quote from George Pelicanos at the beginning of the book where he, he says that there's no solving murder, you know, not unless the dead are going to get up and walk again. So there was that. And the other thing is that you know, people can be so hard-bitten, and some can, but there are other cops who basically never get used to seeing dead bodies and will actually do everything they can to avoid looking at them. So I figured, well, if it's good enough for old Inspector Morse to be able to walk into a crime scene and look at the roof and look at the wall and just look everywhere else, then uh, I'd give her that little quality of mine. Mm. 
And Stuart, I think um, it's safe to say that whilst Harry bears no physical resemblance to you, he probably does share some aspects of your character in terms of his... Um, well, he obviously loves... He loves being in court. He loves the performative aspects of his job. Um, and he's very smart. I, I aspire to be. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the one lesson I've learned about writing uh, in... And I've been writing always. Trouble is I haven't been writing... I was going to say creatively. I think I have, but I haven't been writing fiction. And I'm still not. The one lesson I know is you have to know what you're writing about. Mm. I, I admire people who can write purely out of their imagination. It's totally beyond me. Uh, I love to draw. I'm not very good. But it's the same... And I can only draw something in front of me. I can't be in a room and just take a blank piece of paper and draw anything. I have to be drawing from the life, as it were. Mm. So what I do know, I know myself. That's the first thing yes. I know. Uh, I know people I love and people I hate, I suppose. You know the people you hate very well, and you're thinking. And I know the way the law actually works in the sense of the criminal justice system. So I, I've just put together that, those few things that I do know a bit about and think there are such good stories that if you know barristers or you know lawyers, they'll always, and everybody loves courtroom dramas, we're wasting our good stories telling them only at dinner parties. Absolutely. And I think we mustn't waste these on dinner parties. I'm going to put them in the hands of, of some other people. Other people who can yeah. tell them at dinner parties. Well, and... and Harry Curry is just an obvious, as you say, vessel. Um, but the trouble with that is the law is actually very technical. Mm. And I had to mediate. It's a funny word that I think does work, mediate. Mediate the message or the, the explanation of mm. why, the, why people win trials. I mean, here's, mm. a fa here's a statistic you didn't know. The majority of people who plead not guilty are acquitted. Why? They did it. I mean, crime fiction is about finding the person who did it, and that's the end of the story. It isn't the end of the story if you know anything about the law. That's the beginning. Mm. Uh, really, it's not controversial as to who did it. And with great respect to Pam and what she referred to as the job, I like the way police always say, I'm not in the job anymore. <laughs> the job means a police officer. Um, there's very little detection actually goes on. The real detection is if the person who's going to tell you who did it. You've got to have fizz geeks or whatever. That's, that's how police... And then it's a matter of demonstrating beyond reasonable doubt that that person did it. And, and my stories are not about whether there's a doubt as to who did it, but how it is that people get acquitted, what the role of the lawyer is in this competitive thing between uh, two barristers, the, the prosecutor, who defenders say is somebody who hasn't the courage or ability to compete at the private bar, so <laughs> takes the Queen's shilling, and even the humble legal aid defender, mm. who is at least utterly independent and doesn't have to satisfy any quotas. And it's so to mediate that, I created this other character, which is at the same time as creating the love interest of Arabella Engineer, who has to be a lawyer. But see, Harry gets suspended for misconduct. And he is then the a, F word in court. Yes, to a judge, <laughs> and and I there arrives. I thought he was quoting someone else, though. That's a real. That really did happen. Didn't yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> not to me. I'm not that brave. Uh, but Arabella arrives from London. She had to be exotic, so she is physically different. She's very tall, very striking. Her parents are Indian, but she's English, and she's an English barrister who wasn't really a success in England. And she thinks, as so many of those people of that persuasion do, the colonies will be easier. <laughs> Little does she know it's much more competitive. Mm -hmm. And she arrives and she eventually goes to Harry and says, look, I've, I can at least practice and I'm no good. 
you can't practice and you're a brilliant strategist, we'll make a team. And that's the mechanism for mediating mm. why, why cases are, are lost, why prosecution mm. cases are lost. What I like about both your books, I, I found um, Harry Curry is very educative about the law. Like I really enjoyed learning. And, and I think what you've pulled off so well, which is very hard to do, is make all of that procedural, technical, um, court kind of drama really engaging and interesting, because it, it could have been so terribly dry. But it's very, it's, it's fun, it's, it's engaging, you just want to keep reading, and you get to the end of it and think, oh, I've just learned something. And, and I think, I mean, I think it's a, a real strength of both your writing, because, Pam, you know, you've set your book in a really interesting period of history, and you've got you've got the um, the, the commission. Um, what was it called? Operation uh, Operation Milu, the Independent Commission Against Corruption, going on in the background. That that was the um, Roger Rogers and Nettie Smith era. You've got the Redfern speech happening, and I love that it's happening kind of in the background, off to the side of the main action. But it it situates the story historically really well. What what's determined your choice of that particular like that particular timing? Um, Given that you wrote the book, started writing the book in the late yeah, 90s, I started writing the book in the late nineties, and and by the time I was about eighty thousand words in and realising that the plane was circling the airport and showing no sign of landing at this point, um, you know, by then it was two thousand and one, and I realised that I needed help, so I uh, I took what I'd written and and did some university courses and. Through doing that, I realised that what was bogging down the story I was trying to tell was a backstory, and it wasn't a backstory, it was actually a novel that needed to be told. So that meant winding her back, but because I'm, I'm really interested in writing crime fiction, I think crime fiction does social history really well. Someone like Ian Rankin, um, if you read his books from beginning to end, you chart Scottish devolution. You, you chart the gas, you know, the North Sea bubble. You, you chart all these things that were happening in Scotland because he ties what's going on to the, the culture, the society, the history, the politics. So that was what I was interested in doing. When I realised I was going to have to wind the clock back, then it was a case of, well, there were certain historical events that I had to honour, one of which the most important is how did her parents, an Australian soldier and a Vietnamese woman, meet? And I knew that they had met during the Tet Offensive in Hue. The, the siege of Huey. So that gave me a specific date. That meant that I had a specific date at which she was born. That meant that she was going to be in her early 20s, in the early 90s. So then I started looking at the early 90s and you know, what, what did they have to say? And I realised that by pure serendipity, I'd landed somewhere that it's a decade, I think, that really can be explored. 1992 was a really significant year. In the middle of the year, you had the Mabo uh, High Court decision. The year before that, you had the Aboriginal uh, Royal Commission on Deaths in Custody bring down their report. The end of the year, you had Paul Keating make his Redfern Park speech. You also had going on in the background Operation Milu, the uh, Roger Rogerson, Nettie Smith giving evidence at ICAC. Year before that, you'd had uh, uh, the New South Wales Premier, Nick Greiner, brought down by ICAC. It just struck me that this was really rich and that it lent itself <clears throat> to a series in much the same way that the LA stories, um, LA Confidential and you know, the LA Quartet charted Los Angeles during the 1950s, that this was a way of looking at Sydney and I think Sydney is representative of the nation through the 90s. From the police point of view, you've got Police Royal Commission is going to explode in the middle of the 90s, and that's huge. Politically, middle of the 90s, we have a change of government, and as Paul Keating indicated, when you change the government, you change the nation. Uh, you've got Pauline Hanson waiting in the wings. Mm -hmm. You have all these things through which to see through the eyes of an Australian Vietnamese woman who's born in Australia, who doesn't speak Vietnamese, who speaks Australian with, a, called with an accent. And she's called Ned Kelly. He's called Ned <laughs> Kelly and he's born in Bankstown. So I thought, well, you know, we can play with ideas of identity here as well. But, you know, there's a lot 
to talk about uh, in the 90s in, in this country. So Sydney is, is a nice microcosm to do that. And to get into the different suburbs of Sydney as well. Rich, rich fodder. Yeah. yeah. The, the episodic thing's interesting, of course, when you start writing... Um, I don't know. Well, Stuart, I, I know that you're already, you've written book two and you're on to book three, I think you were saying. Yes. Shame and, so, <laughs> no, it's not. And, you know, for, for those of us lesser mortals, when we start writing, we're never quite sure whether, where, you know, whether the first book will be it and whether, this, yeah. you know, and so sometimes you find yourself like, oh, uh, maybe I need to kind of figure out what the backstory is now. But, but the reason, I mean, um, Harry Curry is very episodic. Like it almost reads like a series of short stories. And you were just saying earlier, there's a reason for that because of the nature of its evolution it started life as a treatment yes it, it started life as a treatment for a television series and the abc being the abc i was telling angela said yes we want to produce this and then the woman who wanted to produce it left the abc and a new one came in and said we don't want to produce this <laughs> and handed it to someone who then wrote rake out of it so the ABC and I are not on good terms at the moment, but Rake is nothing like it. It was just they took the idea of this renegade barrister and it became a character-driven series, and mine is story-driven. Yeah. Uh, and I was listening to Pam and I was thinking, gee, that's deep. I'm, I'm just telling stories. <laughs> But, but in, in telling those stories, I mean, there's quite there's a very contemporary feel to the cases. You've got a bushfire inquest going on in in um, Eden, yes. and you've got uh, you've got a, a wonderful story involving Arabella's distant cousin with the fabulous name of Bruce Booja Singh, known as a Baby, <laughs> um, in the Gold Coast. Um, I'm going to get into trouble with Indian people <laughs> for the name. In fact, I'm researching all the Indian stuff now. Um, Oh, I've got an Indian character in my book too. It's quite, it is quite fun. Um, but what uh, I'm interested in, um, how, to what degree Harry's case history reflects your own? I'm writing about things I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, other barristers come to me and say, oh, now that the book's out, they say, oh, I've got a good story yeah, for Harry. Right. Oh, and I really? say, well, wait until I've finished mine. You know. <laughs> You've worked. I mean, you've, you've practiced in in all over Australia and and uh, and also in in uh, Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu. You were talking about work you've done in Singapore as well. Are you likely to take Harry to those parts of the world? Well, the publisher's keen for for Harry Curry abroad. The first book is Harry Curry, Council of Choice. Uh, the second book is called Harry Curry, the Murder Book. The the one that comes out next year is just five murder cases, and they're interesting because I think. We mm. see this, I think they're interesting. You see a lot of publicity about shaken baby mm. cases, and one of them is based on a real shaken baby um, murder case that I defended in 1994. Mm. And it's interesting to research these. If I may for a moment just talk about that. The conventional medical wisdom is that <gasps> babies are being killed by people who shake them. You can't. You cannot accelerate a child's brain by shaking hard enough to cause a subdural hematoma. How am I doing technically? You can't. What has happened is this whole school of medical expertise has grown up and people are making a good living mm -hmm. out of giving evidence, particularly in America, mm -hmm. but to some extent here as well, about this man who admits he shook the baby, and it's usually the boyfriend, mm -hmm. killed the baby. The case I had was a boyfriend. The baby died of a subdural, it was a three-year-old, nearly three, subdural hematoma. My junior and I, my junior's Tom Malombi, who's written a lot of interesting books about judicial miscarriages, and he's also senior counsel, uh, did a lot of research, and we found it's highly doubtful. We thought it was highly doubtful you could do it. And we won the case on other bases, and you're going to have to read the book to get that, but when I was researching to write it, I, and this was 1994, I formed the view that the doctors were all wrong because they were taking the word of the man who killed the baby. And the man who killed the baby couldn't bring himself to admit he had struck the child. Mm -hmm. What they had done was punched the child or hit the child's head on something. 
And they say, well, nobody will really judge me quite so harshly if I say, well, yes, I lost my temper and I shook it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think I shook it very hard, but the baby got a hematoma and died. That, that was a lie. Mm -hmm. But all the doctors said, oh, well, there, there's the baseline. It's mm -hmm. from shaking. Mm -hmm. When you just can't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the whole of this medical opinion was false. And there was one bloke that I found just three weeks ago when I was rewriting this, and I was checking what the latest, and he has written a couple of really learned papers on it, and he's given a lot of evidence, and now we're corresponding by email. Oh, yeah. And it's terribly interesting to get back into that. And I sent him transcripts from the Sydney trial, mm -hmm. and I sent him what I'd written about it, because I want to use his name. Uh, I'm going to create him as the expert yeah, witness. Yeah. And I think he doesn't mind a bit of publicity <laughs> either. Yeah, of Absolutely. Although that's always a delicate balancing act, isn't it? Having real people mix with, uh, rub shoulders with. Mm. Yeah, that's a criticism Fiction I have practice. of Peter Corus. Mm. You know, uh, he does that. And not so much in the Cliff Hardy books, but in some of the other books. And the, the historical ones. Yeah, right, so. and, and they worry me a bit. That worries mm. me a bit. Mm. Yeah. But, I mean, if you're just using a real name... Is that because of the risk of defamation? And no, your not at all, not at all. I just... Media law, you'd... Makes me uncomfortable. Mm. But, I mean, if you're going to create a, a character in a book, and a lot of writers do it, I, I've got... They'll use, and you look at the acknowledgements, and you find the names of all the characters, uh, those to whom they've acknowledged their thanks at the back. And it's a, a bit of a thanks very much, I've used your name in the book as well for the help you gave me. Yes. Yes. I wouldn't do it to somebody who didn't agree to do it. Mm. Although it's one of the interesting, I don't know if Pam thinks it, one of the interesting things about writing fiction is where do you get the names for the people? Mm. Where do you get yours? Yeah, literally make, make them up. I mean, her name came out of wanting to have a play on words, that, which I, I think Harry Curry is obviously... <laughs> Harry Curry may be a, pay, a play on words, but it's also my uncle's name. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, how lovely. Does your uncle... Is he happy? He's long dead. Oh. Long before I came to this. Therefore, you're allowed to use his but name. But the idea of Harakiri, you know, because yeah. he does sort of, sort of professionally yes, suicidal. Does, does. Yeah, absolutely. I always liked the name. Yeah. yeah. But, but you're right. I mean, it is... Uh, I'll often change characters' names um, through different drafts because it's true. Until you kind of get a name that actually feels and sits right, it, it's, it's a key, isn't it, to, mm. to get into them. I mean, I loved our Arabella Engineer because I'm a cricket tragic. So yeah, well, that's where it, was good for you. Farouk you knew where engineer. it came from. Oh, yeah. I love that. <laughs> well, and having been in, in India too, and they have fabulous surnames. There's oh, engineers yeah. and contractor yes. is another yeah, really well-known yeah. Indian name. And I, I, I love that. That happens in cold weather. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I've got uh, my, most of my characters are Thai, and so oh, one of my challenges yeah. is to find Thai names that are acceptable exactly. to non-Thai speakers yeah. and accessible, and, yeah. and then that they're all different enough so that, so yep. that people don't get yeah. the names mixed up. And my, the book I'm working on now, the, the second book, is set in Cabramatta, and I'm facing that exact problem of of trying to have enough names for a Vietnamese cast that people will be able to keep track of who's who. Oh, that's not a problem for me, because I have Anglo characters and I just name them after boys I hated at school. <laughs> <laughs> I do that with the pedophiles in my novels. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. It's well, a that, great way of exacting revenge, yeah. isn't it? Really? <laughs> I love that uh, John Birmingham, what he's done with uh, his novels. He, he, I think one of his first um, shoot 'em ups that he did, the American uh, ones, and he had, you know, Private uh, Piers Ackerman having his jaw shot <laughs> off and um, you know, Lieutenant we, we Bolt all, was being blown up. We can all only hope. <laughs> <laughs> he had a great deal of fun. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it's an, it, 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 it's an interesting question, isn't it? Fiction, I mean, part of the appeal of fiction is the kind of revenge that you can exact. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, what's, what's led you both to crime fiction? What's the particular impulse after all of the kind of life experience you've had? Is it, is it the best vehicle for the war stories? Is it, is it educative? Is it, what's... Why choose this particular medium when you, you both have skills in non-fiction writing and, and Stuart, you know, you've been a documentarian and, and a playwright, or an apprentice playwright at least. Um, why, why crime fiction? What's the appeal? And what do you read too? What do you like reading in terms of crime fiction? Well, uh, why crime fiction? I think it comes out, if, if you forgive me going out of turn, it comes out of really a dislike 
of the way media treat crime. Mm -hmm. It's so cheaply and superficially and dishonestly done mm. um, that part of the motivation is to say, well, that isn't actually what it's about. I mean, th the terrible sort of knee-jerk response. This man is guilty of molesting a child and he didn't even go to jail. Mm. And so this, is, this has got to be run in this red-necked way without knowing anything about the individualization of uh, the sentence and the fact that sentences do have to be individualized or they're unjust. Mm. It's an attempt to make that process accessible. Uh, you know, that really, I mean, I could have written stuff, I could have written novels about journalism and journalists and, and so on, but that's not so pressing. You know, I, I just think people are so betrayed by the mass media depiction of criminal justice mm -hmm. that really somebody who is in a position to to counter it ought to do it. Mm -hmm. but, but they're also, they've, I mean, it's such an enormous responsibility defending someone because they're usually defenseless. And trying to represent what really motivated people, even if, it's, even if your client wants to plead guilty, and I don't do as much criminal law now as I used to, um, but that task of presenting a guilty person to the sentencing judge in a way that is still going to achieve justice, mm -hmm. and not just for your, your client, but for the victim. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all part of the process. One of the great shibboleths, and to my mind, lies, is this idea of closure in the criminal process. <laughs> it is nonsense. No. You know, and you see the most extraordinary things that ought to be written about. I know a man who is a judge, he's retired now. His child was his beloved only daughter was killed in a car crash by a young man, her friend, who was driving while drunk. Mm. That man gave evidence in support of the young man. Mm -hmm. You know, that must have been a hell of a thing to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if an individual can do that, who knows the system, yeah. then I think the public ought to know a bit about that as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, and somebody in my position can have a go at it. Mm -hmm. and I, I took your so turn. So you're a bit deep, too. <laughs> deep? No, no, yeah, deep as a puddle. Deep, deep no, as a puddle. No, 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 you just got all deep then. <laughs> they saw. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, uh, just to follow on, I mean, it, it's, it's true. The, the, the presentation of crime as entertainment, and that's something that you do have to consider as a crime fiction writer, because when you look at the way the Daily Telegraph will conduct a campaign against a bus driver, who had a cannabis conviction and make sure the man loses his job. Uh, and, and it's just wrong. And you know, the, the witch hunts of pedophiles, it's kind of like pe pedophiles and terrorists are now the, the pariahs of our age that nothing is too bad for them. You, know, you can have the evening, what a, this day to night, a current affair, G up the local neighbourhood, give them a plywood coffin to go around a guy's place. And the reality is most children are going to be abused by their uncle, their father, their cousin, someone they know. And I, I just think if you were a young child who was being abused by a family member and you are watching what happens to people... So, you know, uh, there's generally there's someone they love. Mm. So there's all this conflict, there's all this fraught emotional stuff going on, and then you show publicly what will happen to them if you tell. I, I think children are far more likely not to tell mm. yeah. because that's, you, you're just seeing what's going on. It, it's, it's just so wrong. That, that's such a complex thing. Yeah. And the statistics do show. I mean, I'm, I'm not an advocate for child molesters. No. <laughs> I, think, uh, I have been, yeah. uh, literally, but every single case I've ever seen, the offender was himself abused. Yeah. You know, it's, it's yeah. something you cannot, in this yellow press way of the Herald Sun or the Telegraph, or any, pull this person out as if they're a normal person no. and have to be destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. 
They've been destroyed before they offended yeah. so mm -hmm. often. When you, when you finally, you know, the, the, the people who will want to rage against them have never met one, but if you have had to arrest someone and sit them down and talk to them, and you find that they are the most pathetic people yes. in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, again, it's the, it's the same as people that want to rage against prisoners of TV. They've got it all too good. They're, they're people that have never had to set foot in a jail. Mm. And once you have, you, you, you don't get any great joy out of making sure someone goes there. You just, there, there are people that you want to see punished for the things they've done. I'm thinking of the, the man in Melbourne here that threw his daughter off, mm. off the bridge and I saw that he'd appealed against the severity of his sentence. And, you know, he is someone that I, I think, yeah, you know, you, you need to take a social punishment, but it doesn't mean that you have to create an inhumane system in which to do that. And a lot of prisons are you know, pretty horrible well, places. What, given given the, um, the way that the media treats crime, and given the kind of outrage that real, real crimes, real life crimes, incite in the public, um, how do you explain the appeal of crime fiction? Is it, uh, it? It has the appearance of being controllable, I think. Um, and, and also, I think crime fiction's had a bad rap for a long time, that it's a very conservative genre. Uh, and in a lot of ways, it has been. And in a lot of writers, it still is. It's, you know, I will present you with a crime which I will solve. I will disrupt the status quo, and now I will repair it. But there are also writers that are using crime fiction more in the way of the social novel, and, and I've read some stuff where people said, where did the social novel go, you know, Dickens, Tolstoy, where did it go? It's now, you know, it's, literature's all very introspective, first person, people writing about four blocks of Newtown. <laughs> Insert appropriate <laughs> suburb for Melbourne. It's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, where did the social novel go? Well, in a lot of cases, it went to crime fiction. Mm. But don't you hate the psychological crime fiction? I do. I, I, there's a yeah, whole lot of crime fiction that I don't that. like, and I won't read. I've got a real thing about crime as pathology. I yes. just don't. I don't like those at all. I like. I like to understand the political underpinnings and yeah. and the and the causative fact, the kind of things that you talk yeah. about in that you're talking about on this panel and in your yeah. in your writing, yeah. um, which is that you know people. Those crimes don't occur in a vacuum, no. and they certainly don't don't occur without a kind of context. Yeah. But in, you were asking about the appeal of crime fiction. I, I think Melbourne readers are really best treated in this country <laughs> because they've got Peter Temple mm -hmm. and Gary Disher. Mm -hmm. I have the most immense admiration for both of those, <laughs> and Shane Malone, Maloney. Mm -hmm who writes that more sort of Melbourne political sort yes. of crime and within the Labor Party. I love that. It's very amusing. But Temple's descriptions of, of Melbourne and Disher on the peninsula and so mm. on, particularly in the Wyatt books, mm. I think it's wonderful stuff. Mm. And, D and Disher in those early Wyatt books, and there's now one just called Wyatt, yes. uh, but the early ones, uh, it's so, and I don't say it's from, but it's so akin to Stark, who is Donald Westlake yes. writing the, the Parker books. I mean, you're saying, what do you read? Right. Um, I love American crime. I don't, I'm not a big fan of English crime writing. It's not gutsy enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but the hard-boiled American crime and comic crime, that's, I think, part of the appeal. When you look at Westlake and Lawrence Block, mm -hmm. who's so prolific and have all these genres within there, crime writing, but the comic ones, mm. they're, they are so funny and they're so cleverly written. That's, for me, a very big part of the appeal of that kind of writing. Mm. And I think, well, I can see, I, I see the comic elements in, in your own work and it's interesting that you talk about, I mean, Disha acknowledges Stark as a strong influence. Oh, I him. didn't know that. Well, yeah. I, I mean, can he, see it. He acknowledges it. Yeah. that there was a kind of seed of an idea there. Um, and interestingly, too, all three authors that you mentioned are published by text publishers. <laughs> also publishes me. Yeah. I'm their token chick. Um, <laughs> well, I'd say for, for Stuart, if you you like your American crime, have you read Pelicanos? Josh? Oh yeah, yeah everything, yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. And I'd, I, well, I would add Angela Savage to one of the writers <laughs> that I read because you do exactly the sort of thing that I'm interested in. You go somewhere and you don't. If, if at the end of a crime fiction book, all I've found out is who done it, I'm not very interested to be frank. So I'm interested in 
you know, what's happening in Thailand. For the same reason, the Malanung is one of the best oh, writers terrific. writing in Australia at the moment. Oh, I think this stuff yeah. is wonderful. She's writing about 1950s yeah. South Africa yeah. when the colour bar came down. And again, it's this wonderful example of what you can do with crime fiction. And the way that crime fiction now is no longer <clears throat> about tying it all up in a bow. Because, you know, if you think about it, you're solving crime in apartheid South Africa. There's never there's no, be a happy there's ending. There's no happy ending there, no. no. And, and when it suits them, you're white, and when it suits yeah. them, you're coloured. Yeah, yeah. Same man. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. We, um, we might open up to questions from the floor now to give you the chance to ask Pam or Stuart. And please feel free to share your... Um, your hot tips for a good crime read as well. We were just talking earlier about, you know, one of the, I think one of the most important things at these forums is to share um, information on writers whose work may not have got the airing that we believe it should have. Um, so feel free, if you've, if you've read a good crime novel lately, to let us know. But you better take it that we all want you to read Marlon Nunn. That's yes. right. Yeah. That's right. Yes. And um, Wonderful. Jeffrey yes. McGeechan too, the one that won the, crime, the uh, Ned yeah. Kelly Award for Best Book this year, The Diggers Rest Hotel. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Set in um, Albury, Wodonga just after the Second World War, and it's, it's superb. Yeah. <laughs> Would anyone like to ask a question of the panel? We can keep talking. <laughs> no, it always takes a little while. <laughs> so we can keep talking forever if you don't stop us. And I'll need someone to tell me when we get to seven. Thanks, I'm not scared. Um, I'm interested in your comments about the uh, pedophiles. I know that they are the easy bad guys. I made them a bad guy in one of my stories. Um, but I'm interested in your thoughts, Angela, in particular, in the difference between um, the pedophiles here in Australia that we portray as being the, the villains versus the travelling child sex offenders that uh, exist in Southeast Asia where you said your books. Mm. Uh, yes, I do, Jared. And I did actually, th th my first book, Behind the Night Bazaar, touched on that theme because I've also done the research. I think it's, um, it's a very, it is a very confronting subject and um, I have a family history pedophilia in my extended family and uh, fortunately not being someone who suffered the abuse myself but uh, you know so there's always that question of like well these are people with stories and families I think the interesting thing about the um, the cross-cultural offender is the thought processes that go on in a lot of their heads where it's all about oh well here it's acceptable you know mm -hmm. and here I'm supporting the local economy because all of these things child prostitution they're just part of Thai culture and you know so there is a kind of um, you know that's I think there is a different kind of offender um, who who kind of has those internal voices uh, versus the those who have the the history of, the, of abuse themselves and also understand there's quite a high level of um, intellectual disability amongst offenders as well and and that that can be a factor so it is it, it, that book was an attempt to try and look at some of the complexity around that as you say that you know that they're very much demonised and and I think. Crime writers, if we are to be um, brave and to engage with the kind of social responsibility of the crime writing, we do want to push some of those boundaries a little, um, which is not to excuse any of the behaviour or certainly any of the consequences of that kind of abuse, but to try and perhaps understand it better in order to um, have a more intelligent response to preventing it, I think. Do any of you two have thoughts on that? No, I, I agree. Uh, absolutely. I think we have a responsibility to take on that hard stuff. And it is very hard, yeah. isn't it? That yeah. stuff is, no matter what angle you pro approach yeah. it from, whether, yeah. whether it is a matter of detection, whether it's a matter of defense, whether it's a matter of yeah. sentencing, whether it's a matter of rehabilitating. We don't have the answers to any mm. of those things. No. Mm. There may never be those answers. Mm. Mm. But we sure as hell aren't gonna find it by, you know, the knee-jerk reactions and the closing of the doors on the discussion, I think that's... But I was pleased to hear that apparently it's not all that significant because Kevin Rudd said that the most appalling crime there was in the whole calendar was people smuggling. Right. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. Yeah. what stone have you been living under, <laughs> Kev? 
Yes, and how would, how would um, Oscar Schindler feel about that? Well, <laughs> yes, and who, who? And Les Murray. Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah, soccer, soccer mm. Les. Yeah. Mm. But does anyone else have a question? That was a really hard question. Does anyone mm. else have a slightly easier question <laughs> that I'm going to ask? You only said that because it was asked of you. <laughs> yes. We'll bring you a microphone. When I say we, I'm using the royal we, obviously. <laughs> Stuart, is there any reason why um, criminal barristers could not run both sides of a case, uh, both the prosecution and the defence? Uh, we would eliminate the uh, mug copper up against the, uh, the flash silk. Um, what do you think? I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> do you mean the same person? Yes. What, uh, prosecutes and defends? Yes. Oh, well, that, that's not an adversarial... Well, uh, why do we need adversarial? Well, uh, because I have to tell you, it's the best system I've seen. It may not be perfect, but in this, uh, the theory is the prosecution is seeking the truth. That should involve disclosure of anything relevant, including things that exculpate or mitigate. Now that's the theory. And the theory about defence is you should defend somebody as if it were yourself. Now that, when it works that way it works very well. But the trouble is barristers are very competitive by nature. And the, re the reality of criminal defence is really anything goes so far as the defence is concerned. No, I, I think for it to work. But the crowns are joining that and they just want to win. And when you've got two, the, the diff difference is from the perspective of the barrister, the crown shouldn't be trying to win. Only the defence should be trying to win. The crown should be trying to get the truth. Mm -hmm. But because of the nature of the people who practice, they are trying to beat each other. Mm -hmm. And they want to walk out of there saying, I beat you. And it's really got nothing to do with the merits of the case. It's all ego. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm so uncomfortable with it. <laughs> it, was, uh, I, I, but, it did occur to me that, you know, they say that um, politics is showbiz for ugly people and perhaps the law is, is competitive sport yeah. for the ones who weren't, who weren't built for rugby. No, it's... Well, <laughs> Well, yeah, I think it's acting for those who can't remember lines. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's total competition, and it's competition the whole way down the line. Because, you know, but you, you're talking about the Crown, and the people who are doing the Crown's job are the cops. And they are incredibly competitive, and that, that's what I got tired of. Because it, it really... it does it, You were saying earlier, you know, that... Um, criminal investigation doesn't actually involve that much detecting. And... To a degree, that's right. I, I'd argue that the jobs I liked doing the most were the ones where you did assemble a lot of evidence before you even brought the person in to talk to them. Because it really doesn't matter what the crime is. When you bring someone in under arrest, it doesn't matter what the job is, what the crime is, it'll come down to two people sitting in a room opposite each other, over a table, and one person is trying to dominate that communication and get the person to tell them probably the one thing in the world that they do not want to say. And that's a copper and a criminal. So if you can bring an awful lot of stuff to the table, if the person's response is silence, then you know it's not, not such a bad thing. But if your case depends on getting someone to tell you what they did, the worst thing that they did, uh, an old detective sergeant I used to know, that was his opening gambit to everybody that he ever met. He'd shake their hands and go, Angela, nice to see you. What's the worst thing you've ever done? <laughs> <laughs> and he used to get amazing answers because, uh, you know, people would be so off, off, off guard. But uh, for me, I, I got tired of that. And it's interesting that your guy plays rugby because that really, uh, I thought, yeah. ah, that is so much the way a lot of the policemen that I worked with thrive on it. So, you know, if you think the bar is competitive, you ought to see what the, uh, the, the clerks of the court, the armed clerks of the court, how competitive they are. They want to win, and they want to win because they're not getting five grand a day. <laughs> if they can sit in the witness box and not get a silk to you know, win that round, they walk out and they, they, they've won. 
Mm. Oh yeah, and that's another competition. It's I, a total, I've played that game. A I bit. know, yeah. and it's just. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the, the last day I gave evidence in court. I, I decided I was going to leave the job, and it was an old job that had come up. And going out to to Bankstown Court, and it was against someone who I won't. It wasn't Stuart. <laughs> someone he's dead actually now, uh, who was re- renowned for defending drug dealers and. But he was a very funny man. Uh, it depends on which one we're talking about. Um, Pat Costello. <laughs> he, he had a reputation for uh, getting G'd up artificially. And um, <laughs> I was due to give evidence, and the morning session had gone quite well, and the, the blokes were coming out going, it's really quiet tonight. It's really quiet. Yeah, you hardly had any questions. So we adjourn for lunch. I'm in the box straight after lunch, and I go in, and the man's insane. He's frothing at the mouth, he's spitting, <laughs> dancing around the courtroom, he's accusing me of everything under the sun. And I just remembered sitting there thinking, in six months' time, you're going to still be here doing this, and I'm not. <laughs> and I'm never going to have to do this again. And I was elated. <laughs> so it sort of kept me sane. <laughs> We might have time for one more question that we could squeeze in. Oh, my question's addressed to uh, Pam. You said that if you read a, a book and it, you only find out who's done it, that you're not happy. Perhaps you need some historical background or whatever. Um, could you just explain that? Because to me, I'd like to know what's happened, not that there is a Royal Commission or mm. there's a change of pen? I, I think it's a case that the crime genre is incredibly broad. So there's something there for everyone. Um, you know, it, it's crime fiction now includes the leaked short stories of a, a rogue barrister. You know, we can add that. That's, that's another little subgenre that's turned up. There's crime fiction that's told from the point of view of the investigative cats. Um, you know, there's something out there for everyone. For some people, the satisfaction of reading a crime novel comes from something that is very well plotted and comes to a satisfying end. Ah, I didn't see it coming, but now I can see all the points. That's it's not as satisfying. Rules, yes. mm. Yeah, that, that's kind of, you know, the Agatha Christie. Um, and I think what, she's actually a really good example. Her original books are like little miniature clockwork pieces that it will kind of come down to the 8.45 from Cheltenham always goes past that point and blows its whistle, but on that day it ran five minutes late and, yeah, that'll be the turning point as to how the mystery is unravelled. If you watch the Agatha Christie's that they've remade recently, they've taken some amazing liberties with the stories, but I think they've made them richer because they have actually included a lot more cultural and social subtext to the books. So uh, for me, you know, my choice of reading, and God knows there's an awful lot of crime fiction out there to be read, they're the ones that I'll cleave towards. But you know, that's not to say that other people aren't going to get a lot of satisfaction out of reading what they, they cleave towards. It's a, it's a wonderfully rich genre, and I can thoroughly recommend both um, Pam's and Stuart's novels to you. Just In fact, I thought I might, um, <laughs> I might finish up by reading you a very short extract from each, because I think there's a lovely contrast between their respective workplaces, and we have been talking about the link between work and art. Um, so this is uh, Arabella Engineer, who's um, Harry Curry's love interest, and her comments... Uh, to Harry about the, about the bar. The bar's like a boys' boarding school, isn't it? Calling people by their surnames, wearing a silly uniform, espousing redundant values, accepting the arbitrary discipline, tolerating girls but never accepting them as equals, <laughs> and eternally competing. <laughs> and let's contrast this with news description of the Bankstown Police Station. <laughs> She inhaled the familiar Bankstown detective's perfume of stale cigarettes, spilt beer, fast food and running shoes. Not so much an office as a warren of rooms with doorways knocked through walls that circled back to where you began. (laughs) Please join me in thanking our guests this evening. (laughs) 